I am not voting for Donald Trump. I'm excited and looking forward to casting that vote for Donald Trump. Some Republican presidential electors are divided ahead of a key vote on December 19th to make November's election results official. Members of the Electoral College will meet in their states to cast votes. Electors typically vote in sync with how their state did on election day. Chris Supran doesn't see it that way. He's an elector from Texas, a state which went for Trump and is vowing to support someone else besides a New York businessman. I think Donald Trump has disqualified himself in his handling of foreign policy already, where he's made a major gaffe on the Taiwan one China issue. I think his financial conflicts of interest are an objective uh, disqualifier for him from the presidency. Texas does not have a law bounding electors to vote for Trump. Their Secretary of State's office explains this has not been an issue in the past. Supran says he has not settled on his choice just yet. I'm looking for someone with broad foreign policy uh, and domestic experience in both the legislative as well as executive realms. But I have not chosen a candidate. Other Republican electors like Michael McNeely are pushing back on him for not getting behind Trump. When you go into the process of becoming an elector, you are, you are saying that you will cast the vote for the individual that, that wins in, in your state. And so I think to not do that is, is completely wrong for those that don't want to do that that are sore losers. The electors have competing views on whether the presidential contest is over. It's a done deal. The will of the people have spoken. Now the electors are going and casting the vote. And, the, and listen, you know, for, for one person to do something like that is not going to change the, the election whatsoever. The people have spoken and, and we need to move forward. If they feel and their conscience leads them to say that they should rubber stamp uh, that is the nominee. That's their choice and their prerogative, but I don't think it's appropriate. The incoming Trump administration says they're confident the vote later this month will be simply a formal confirmation of November's results. In New York, Christopher Snyder, Fox News. Um, I don't know if you know, but after you were uh, on this program a few minutes ago, Donald Trump tweeted about you. He said, let me read it again, Chuck Jones, who is president of United Steelworkers 1999, has done a terrible job representing workers. No wonder companies flee country, exclamation point. Um, what do you say, uh, Chuck, when you hear that? Well, first of all, that wasn't very damn nice. Uh, but uh, with, with Donald Trump saying that, that must be, I mean, I'm doing a good job because these people are making a decent wage at Carrier, and uh, I feel like I'm uh, somewhat involved in uh, making that happen, uh, where he does everything he can to keep the unions out uh, in his hotels uh, and casinos here in this country, depriving them of making a living wage. So uh, I don't put a whole hell of a lot of faith in whatever he says because... Uh, I just don't pay a lot of attention to him. Now, do you still stand by what you told me earlier, which is you had your frustrations, you thought he should have had his numbers right on the jobs, but but you were still grateful, and you made it clear that you were grateful to Donald Trump yeah. for what he had done in saving the jobs that he did save, the nearly 800 jobs uh, from, from Carrier. Do you still stand by that? Do you still feel gratitude towards uh, Donald Trump? I stand by 100%. Instead of dressing that and saying, hey, you know, I got that wrong, and, uh, you know, Jones is right, uh, on his um, numbers, you know, then he wants to attack me. Uh, I think that's pretty uh, low down, low life, and, you know, uh, does it bother me? No, nah, hell no, I'm still going to be able to sleep tonight, and uh, life will go on tomorrow for me. All right, joining us now with Reaction, the Deputy Executive, Executive Director of the Trump Transition Team, Dave Bossy. Dave, good to see you again. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. Very um, well. Very well. If you don't have a position yet. When are you getting your position? <laughs> I don't know. You'll have to talk to uh, the President-elect about that. Um, well, obviously, you, you played a big part in the campaign, so I would expect you probably are going to Washington with him, and, and you and Bannon work well together. We've all been friends for years. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Maybe uh, let me give the President-elect more credit and for being more gracious than I would be, more magnanimous than I would be. I'm beginning to worry, though, because to me, a guy like Governor Romney, who called him a liar, a racist, a misogynist, unfit for office, a fraud, and a huckster, is not the type of guy that I think is going to be loyal when things hit the fan. And you and I have been around this game far too long to know that those moments are coming. The people that were loyal to him during the campaign will be the people that will be best and loyal during tough times. And tough times are coming. Well, look, we're, we're going to have some tough times in the White House. Uh, president-elect uh, Trump, then when he becomes President Trump, uh, will obviously be uh, challenged when it comes to our economy and 
to you know across the world as uh, as he engages all of the problems that we have uh, today. Look, I, I believe that what what. President-elect Trump has done is an incredibly deliberative process. He has really cast a wide net. Uh, he's talked to a lot of different people about the Secretary of State's job. And, you know, if he feels that Mitt Romney is the right man at the right time for this job, then I don't know that I... What experience does he have to be Secretary of State? Well, you know what... The, like Rudy Giuliani's traveled the world. Sure. Newt Gingrich has traveled the world. You know, Mitt Romney has, is not somebody who's lived, lived under a rock. He is somebody who's well experienced with, with negotiations, well versed, uh, uh, and has traveled to himself uh, around the world. I'm, I'm not that worried about that. I, I think that the president elect will make the right decision Look, for him. He ran, he got elected. I didn't That's run, right. I didn't get elected. Right. It's he his call's the... not my call. I understand. But I guess the single biggest percentage of calls to my radio show, 550 stations, we have a lot of people listening, is about, well, why is he meeting with Al Gore? Why does he say he's friends with Obama? Why is he meeting with Mitt Romney? Why is he meeting with um, some of the other people that he's been meeting with? Well, look, he, he, Rahm Emanuel, <laughs> Dead Fish, he does, let me ask this question, he does know they're not his friends. He understands oh, I, that. I, I, look, you know, the, the president-elect is not... He's smart. He, he is incredibly smart. He understands that, that what these folks are about. But he also is somebody who's trying to show America that he wants to be president of all of the people, something that okay, he ran I can, on. Okay, I can and accept I think, that. That's I think smart. that having these meetings is incredibly smart for the optics of showing the American people he will take guidance and advice, whether or not he takes the advice and adheres to the advice, he will at least listen uh, from a lot of wide-ranging uh, voices, and I think that those are some of them. To me, it's all about the agenda. There's no point in winning an election if you're not going to advance the agenda. And the sure. agenda to me is simple. Originalists for the Supreme Court, extreme vetting, corporate tax 15 percent, repatriation 10 percent, eliminating Obamacare, health savings accounts, energy independence is a big part of job creation and I think the creation of wealth in this country, and education back to the states, building the wall. If he does those things, he'll have a successful presidency. Right. I heard him reiterate those points last night, so I have confidence the agenda is the same. Will, and I love the generals that he appointed. Mm -hmm. Will that agenda change, or do you think some of these people he's talking to will have a negative influence on him? Look, you know, the president-elect has uh, in his mind what his agenda is. He ran on it. He understands it. He believes in it. And he's been repeating it. Uh, without question, every day uh, since the election and, and, and for a year before. So no one needs to tell him really what his agenda is. And I think that is what we have to count on, that the people that he is bringing together, his cabinet, mm -hmm. the, the generals, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, Steve Mnuchin at Treasury, and, and Wilbur Ross at right. Commerce, and these other incredibly talented people that he's bringing together, Ben Carson uh, at HUD, which is interesting, is going to really allow him uh, to get that agenda uh, forwarded for the American people. I just, to me, I think loyalty is the best trait you need in an environment like D.C., where if you want a friend, get a Pat and a dog. <laughs> right. And if you want two friends, get two dogs. Um, it's a tough town. And it, it is. And, and look, President Trump, when he They're is not going like to is, is gonna come for him every day. Dave, uh, good to see you. Thanks very much. Right. Welcome to my chambers. When President-elect Donald Trump announced that he would have a material difference in the enforcement of immigration laws than President Barack Obama, meaning he would deport all 11 to 13 million undocumented immigrants in the United States of America, a number of American cities changed their plans and called themselves sanctuary cities. What is a sanctuary city? There's no legal term for sanctuary city, but the term used by the government and by the media basically means a local town or city where social services are expanded to provide for those who are undocumented, those who are here illegally, and where they, the authorities will not cooperate with the federal government. President-elect says these local towns, and they're the biggest cities in the country, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, and New York, have an obligation to help enforce federal immigration law. What did the Supreme Court say about it? The Supreme Court says the federal government cannot force the states 
or the cities and towns within them to enforce immigration law. And this is the dilemma for Donald Trump. Because the same Supreme Court says if a state or city is going to make social services available for people who live there, it has to make them available for everyone who lives there. Citizen, non-citizen, legal resident, non-illegal resident. So if the city of Chicago or New York wants to make it difficult for the federal government to locate and deport undocumented immigrants, it can do so. And if the federal government wants the officials in the cities of Chicago or New York to help enforce federal law, they cannot do so. What can the president-elect do about it? Well, he can use a carrot instead of a stick. He can get legislation enacted once he's in the White House, which would provide financial grants to these cities only if they cooperate with enforcing federal immigration law. Very complicated and intended to allow the states to frustrate the federal government. I like frustration in government. The more difficult it is to govern, the better it is for human freedom. That is at least the theory of the diffusion of power in the American Constitution and in our democratic republic. Welcome to my chambers. Fight the good fight. Uh, Mr. Secretary, what do you uh, make of this latest sort of example of Donald Trump responding to something uh, that he's read or, or seen on television? Well, Donald Trump is, is doing this quite a lot, Anderson. Uh, he's using Twitter. He has these tweets going out uh, against people who criticize him. Uh, not only Chuck, uh, the person you just talked to, uh, Chuck Jones, uh, but also uh, Alec Baldwin when he satirized uh, Mr. Trump on Saturday Night Live, also individual journalists who criticize Donald Trump. Uh, let me just say, because Donald Trump is probably watching right now, let me just say, with all due respect, Mr. Trump, you are our president-elect of the United States. You are looking and acting as if you are mean and petty, thin-skinned and vindictive. Stop this. This is not a fireside chat. This is not what FDR did. That's, this is lifting people up. This is actually penalizing people for speaking their minds. What you did with Boeing the other day, minutes after the CEO of Boeing was quoted as saying that you, Mr. Trump, you, President-elect Trump, were wrong on international trade, what did you do? You tweeted that Boeing should have an order canceled. Well, you called it a $4 billion order, and that meant Boeing Boeing's own prices, its share prices, plummeted. So, in other words, what you, Mr. Trump, what you, what you would like is for no one, not a CEO, nobody on television, no journalist, nobody to criticize you. You take offense at that. Well, you are going to be president very shortly. You are going to have at your command not just Twitter, but also the CIA, the IRS, the FBI, if you have this kind of thin-skinned vindictiveness attitude toward anybody who criticizes you, we are in very deep trouble, and, sir, so are you. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about the picks that we've got right now. Let's get your take first sure. on General Kelly in terms of Homeland Security. There were a number of people who would have liked that job, and we'll talk about that in a second, but first, your thoughts on him. Well, he's a terrific pick, and you know, there's been a lot of talk about how uh, how uh, President-elect Trump is choosing a lot of generals. Well, in the case of Homeland Security, it's a great idea to put a general in charge because it reinforces the message that the battle against terror is a matter of war, not a matter of law enforcement. And putting a general in charge of protecting the homeland is smart, and Kelly is a perfect pick for it. Kelly, you know, he one of his principal missions is going to be securing the southern border. He was the head of U.S. Southern Command, which is the military command in charge of protecting our hemisphere, uh, and uh, he was a one when he in that job he was sounding the alarm when very few people were listening about Iranian infiltration of South America the infiltration of Hezbollah terrorists who could come into this country and infiltrate terrorists through our poorest southern border so he's going to put a, a big focus on that you know when you look at the process and how this is all taking place Kelly's name first surfaced in the Secretary of State search and there's an mm -hmm. interesting piece in the Wall Street Journal this morning about how these vetting processes go. First of all, they're very public. You walk through the lobby. Second of all, he grills these people. And he, he tries to sort of get them off their game a little bit. He wants to see how aggressive and how smart they are about their subject matter, right? 
Oh, absolutely. And look, well, he had a lot of practice on The Apprentice and grilling a potential, sure uh, potential uh, employee. So, I mean, I, I think Donald Trump, uh, one of his qualities, where, where, whatever, you, whether you're a supporter or an opponent of Donald Trump, one of his qualities certainly is picking and finding talent and picking talent. And he's doing a fantastic job. I mean, this is, this is going to be one of the most conservative cabinets any president has ever put forward. If you think about, you know, Jeff Sessions as Attorney General, Betsy DeVos, one of the nation's leading champions of school choice and education, Ben Carson at HUD, who is the, probably the first HUD secretary who's actually lived in an inner city, uh, as opposed to you know talked about Great it from a, from the uh, from the ivory tower. And now you've got General Kelly and you've got Scott Pruitt now uh, at EPA, who's going to be a fantastic choice for EPA. Yeah, um, you know, in terms and in of fact, who... it, you know, it's funny. There, uh, you called it the APA. It's going to become the American Protection uh, uh, Agency <laughs> uh, under it. Scott That's Pruitt. So I think it actually I'm, should be the right you. name, APA, instead of us. EPA. Um, <laughs> in terms of who didn't get picked, Homeland Security, one of the names that pops up is Rudy Giuliani, uh, who did an amazing sure. job with New York City after 9-11 and who uh, may or may not still be in the mix for the State Department. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, Rudy Giuliani was a cute. I, I was, I'm a New Yorker, and uh, I, you know, I was in the Pentagon on September 11th. So Rudy Giuliani was just, uh, he was a terrific mayor, and he was a terrific leader in the days after 9/11. So I would love to see him in some sort of senior position. He, he really uh, put all of his chips on. It looks like he put all of his chips on Secretary of State. We'll see if that bet pays off or not. Uh, he, I think he would have been a great candidate for uh, Homeland Security as well. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll see where he comes out on that. Mm. Mike McCall was another name that was in there for Homeland Security, a uh, member of Congress who's been yep. very active in this as well. So um, it's clear that there's sure. a lot of people that are in the mix and that some of them, you know, maybe are getting moved into different positions as they fall on the list of somebody that Donald Trump really, really likes and wants to find something for. Talk to us a little bit about Pruitt because people who are um, concerned about the environment, some of them, uh, feel that he is not the right guy for this. What do you think? Well, well, Pruitt's concerned about the environment. I mean, we're all concerned about the environment, but Pruitt believes he's, I mean, it's great having a state official in charge of the EPA because Pruitt believes that the states were intended under the Constitution to be the principal regulators of the environment. People closest to the land should be making decisions about how the land and how the environment is taken care of. And so he's, he, you know, President Obama has been abusing the powers of the EPA to impose a radical environmental agenda on this country uh, that, uh, that is killing jobs and hurting the economy. Uh, and Pruitt's going to roll that back so we can have clean energy development. You know, the Sierra, it's funny, the Sierra Club said, uh, which is a left wing uh, environmental group, said that it's like putting an arsonist in charge of putting out fires. Well, with all respect, we need to light a fire under this, uh, this economy, and the EPA has been pouring cold water on the economy, on energy development, and all these other things. And so we, that's exactly the kind of person we want at the EPA someone who's going to have responsible energy production, is going to protect the environment, defer to states, but also clear the way so we can create jobs and become energy independent, both for our national security and our economic security. A source telling CNN that President-elect Donald Trump will nominate yet another general to his cabinet, retired Marine General John Kelly, who will helm the Department of Homeland Security pending Senate confirmation. Also today, President-elect Trump saying his Secretary of State pick could come as early as next week. And Mitt Romney is still apparently in the running. Trump also said today he's honored to be named Time Magazine's Person of the Year, but he did take some issue with the subhead tucked underneath his name, President of the divided states of America, it says. Trump denied he's done anything to divide the country. Okay. Trump this morning also taking credit for the huge market rally since his election four weeks ago. The Dow Jones Industrial Average today closing at 19,547 points, more than 1,200 points above where it was on November 8th. CNN's Jason Carroll is live outside Trump Tower. And Jason, the Trump transition team also confirmed that Trump has tapped Iowa Governor Terry Branstad to be the next ambassador yeah. to China. Why Governor Branstad? Well, there are a couple of reasons for that. This is a man, this is a governor who's had a long-standing relationship with the Chinese president since 1985. The thought is because of that relationship, perhaps he can smooth over some of the fallout from that controversial call that Trump had with the Taiwanese leader. Trump, for his part, though, Jake, says that he's feeling lucky that he made the cover of Time magazine. President-elect Donald Trump can add another title to his name, Time Magazine Person of the Year. It's a great honor. It means a lot. But look closely at the cover. The caption calls him President of the Divided States of America, a moniker Trump told NBC News is not his fault. I didn't divide them. They're divided now. I mean, there's a lot of division. 
and we're going to put it back together, and we're going to have a country that's very well healed. Trump took that same message on the road Tuesday night at a rally in North Carolina. We will heal our divisions and unify our country. When Americans are unified, there is nothing we cannot do. Nothing. No task is too great, no dream too large, no goal beyond our reach. The president-elect's goal right now, piecing together his administration. CNN confirms Trump will name retired Marine General John Kelly, the former head of Southern Command, as his Homeland Security Secretary. Today, he also named Iowa Governor Terry Branstad as his ambassador to China. One of the reasons Branstad has a decades-long relationship with Chinese President Xi Jinping. As for the Secretary of State job, no decision yet. Trump saying Mitt Romney is still in the running and insists he isn't stringing the former rival along. No, it's not about revenge. It's about what's good for the country. We had some tremendous uh, difficulty together, and now uh, I think we've come a long way. But it's not just his cabinet. Trump is also calling out companies who he says are making bad deals for America, like Carrier and Boeing. And I hope I'm judged from the time of the election as opposed to from January 20th because the stock market has had a tremendous bounce and people are seeing very good things for business in this country. Trump threatened Tuesday to cancel Boeing's deal to build a new Air Force One, tweeting in part that costs are out of control. Since then, Trump says he's talked to Boeing's CEO and both agreed to work it out. We're going to get the prices down, and if we don't get the prices down, we're not going to order them. We're going to stay with what we have. Today, Trump also met with Chicago mayor and former Obama White House chief of staff, Rahm Emanuel. One about uh, White House operations uh, what, and how to make that work. Second, we also discussed uh, immigration. Emmanuel's former boss, President Obama, is also on Trump's call list, telling NBC News that he and the current president have talked several times, asked for his advice, and takes his recommendations seriously. The president is uh, responsive to um, you know, requests and phone calls from the president-elect. He's certainly pleased that he can uh, offer uh, advice and assistance that may be useful to the incoming administration. And Trump has continued to take meetings here today at Trump Tower, including meeting uh, with Oklahoma's Attorney General Scott Prude, who's looking to be a likely choice to head up the EPA, much to the uh, disappointment of many of Pruitt's uh, critics who say he's too close to the fossil fuel industry. Trump tomorrow, Jake, will be heading to OSU to meet with victims and first responders from there. Jake. All right, Jason Carroll, thank you so much.